Good evening. It's uh, certain we certainly don't do things in half measures up here on the north coast, do we? When we have rain, it's ice blocks. When we have fires, they're huge. That's, uh, we hope that that's helped us for the week ahead, which could possibly be an interesting one for fires too. But the Lord is good. Tonight I want to uh, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, please. And I want to challenge uh, a conception that we, we may have about this passage. You may have heard this, you may not have heard this, um, but I'm challenged in the way that I think about this. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we're going to read verses 7 through 12. And Toffs, I know this is the third time this weekend you have to listen to me preach. But if we get through this, there's food. Okay? So it's, it's good. It's, they, they are, they're more spiritual than me. That's right. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Let's read verses 7 through 12. Then I returned, and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet, there, yet is there no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Let's pray and we'll commit to the time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are a good God. And we thank you that you give good gifts. And uh, Lord, we've been praying for rain and you delivered rain in abundance. We ask, Lord, that that would follow up soon. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that you... Uh, answer prayer based upon your righteousness not based upon our righteousness uh, we ask lord that you would please uh, lord bless our time in your word tonight we ask that you would help us to have a clear understanding of a vital principle for each of us in our lives and we pray that you would please bless our time open our eyes we ask in jesus name amen when i read that passage particularly that verse two are better than one i'm not going to ask you to raise your hands but how many thought okay this is talking about marriage don't have to raise your hand but that's often the way that we think about this verse but the preacher is not i'm confident that he is not speaking specifically about marriage it may be a principle that is similar to but it's not about marriage uh, some of the things in that portion that might cause us to think that are that little phrase two are better than one or perhaps uh, the example that was given in verse 11 again if two lie together then they have heat but how can one be warm alone perhaps they're the evidences that we look to in that passage to come to that conclusion but what i want to show to you is that this addresses a much broader passage, a much broader principle. And it's a responsibility that remains unchanged regardless of our relationship status. And I think sometimes we cop out of this principle by just thinking that it applies simply to this. By the end of this message, I want you to think of something different when you hear that principle stated. Okay, I want you to think of something other than finding somebody to marry and for those of you who are here for the youth service, don't go home and say, the pastor said two is better than one, I need to get married this week. Because that's certainly not the application of tonight's message. Okay. There is something much, much bigger here and something far more serious and something that's going to benefit all of us. So let's have a look. There's three points that I want to go through tonight. The first of those is looking at the laboring loner, the laboring loner in verse 8. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor, and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. 
the word there at the start where it says there is one alone in the hebrew it's quite um straightforward that it's saying there is one all alone and it's emphasizing the lonesomeness of this person there is one all alone longman in his commentary says no friend no business partner no wife no family speaking about someone being all alone and it's emphasized by that bit that comes after it where it says there is one alone and there is not a second <laughs> just in case you don't know what it means by being alone there is not a second the kind of um, aloneness is specified even further when it goes on to say yea he hath neither child nor brother now it's interesting that uh, child and brother are the two people who are mentioned by name here because it helps us to narrow down what kind of alone or what sort of scenario this applies to uh, the child is the one who would inherit from this person's work a brother also could be an inheritor of this person's work if they're down the uh, line. Uh, or the child or the brother could be the co-laborer, the person who works with that person in their job. And so the vanity of this solitude is not speaking about a relationship status um, solitude. There is a different context for this verse, and I'm sure it's very obvious to you as you read it through and just focus upon this verse. The vanity of this person's solitude is that there is no end of all his labor, it says there. And he works tirelessly, works endlessly. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Despite the hard work, despite the long work hours, the things that he works for doesn't bring him personal satisfaction. It's not good enough to make him happy. And then at the end, Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? He doesn't stop to think that he has no colleague to share his work with or the profits of it. And he doesn't stop to think that there is no one coming after me to inherit all the stuff that I've laid up for myself. And so this person is working very, very hard for themselves on their own. There is no one to share it with and they're not satisfied from what they've gotten. That's a very unsatisfied, that's a vain situation, isn't it? Hard work for no satisfaction and no one to leave it to or share it with at the same time. Now, we don't know if this person's uh, aloneness or their solitary, solitude is due to loss or whether it's due to deliberate isolation. And I would suggest to you that it's the latter. And this person is alone because of deliberate choices that they have made and the reason I suggest that to you is because they're ignorant of the fact that they are alone okay it says there at the end of verse 8 uh, neither saith he for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good he's not saying to himself I can't leave it to anybody else he hasn't figured this out he's working hard he's not satisfied and he's not even thinking of the fact that he's alone Okay, so the person is in this situation, is not um, mindful of their aloneness or their solitude. And so this person is probably working themselves to the point of solitude. It's not that they're upset about being alone. It's probably because they have done this deliberately through their work ethic. And I think that's what Solomon is trying to emphasize. And many people end up in this sort of predicament. Many people end up lonely without satisfaction because of the way that they work or because of the focus upon work or things of a selfish nature. This is the person that when friends say, hey, do you want to come out? They say no, no, no. To the point where the friends stop asking. This is the person who when friends say, hey, come and do this, they say, no, I'd rather sit on the lounge and play with my phone. Or I'd rather sit at home and do something by myself. To the point where friends stop asking. This is the person that is hard to work with because they work on the premise that because I can do it better than anybody else, I'm just going to do it all myself. And so I'm not going to share my work with other people. I'm not even going to trust people to do things. I'm just going to do it all myself because I know I can do it the right way. 
and they end up by themselves as a result. And maybe it's not selfishness that gets the person to this place. Maybe it's uh, poor uh, self-image. Maybe it's that they think other people don't think that I can do a good job and so I'm just not going to bother with working with other people. Uh, They consider that their own output is not good enough and so they project that onto what other people think of them. And so they are by themselves chugging away unsatisfied with the fruits of their own labours and having nobody else to share it with. If we aren't careful, we can push people away. We can push people away in a way that damages our long-term relationships to the point where we ourselves are unsatisfied, working too hard, and having nobody to share the important things of life with. And we know that that happens, don't we? (laughs) It's a human problem. It might look easier, but a solo life is more difficult. A life where we push people away is a more difficult life. And it's not the life that we were designed for. And Solomon goes on to explain this by asking some simple questions or pointing out some uh, simple principles. And that brings us to our second point, a profitable partner. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9. He says those uh, words that are well known, two are better than one. I would suggest to you that perhaps we are unaware of how often we doubt this truth. Perhaps we're unaware of how often we doubt it or challenge this idea as being true. Relationships and cooperation are very, very important for us. And it is important for us to remember that after our relationship to God, they are the next priority that God has for us. The relationships that we have with other people ought to be our next priority after our relationship with God. And that is because those relationships with other people are the things that can extend into eternity as well. And this idea is under more pressure these days uh, when people can work in isolation Uh, where people can spend most of their time in isolation and can forsake spending time with other people. And this is why Solomon argues two are better than one. It's a message that we need to hear. He goes on to cite some proofs. Verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. There is a profitability increase when you go from one person to two people. And not only going from one person to two people, but if you do the math, what Solomon is actually saying is that two people working together can accomplish more than the sum of two people working alone. It's more profitable to have two people working together than it is to have two people working independently. They have a good reward for their labor when they're working together well. That's the first proof. Second proof is in verse 10. He says, for if they fall... One will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. It's a very practical example, this one, isn't it? Safety in accidents. Start the uh, idea that you have of this passage being about marriage starts to fall down when you think, okay, people are going to get married so that they can pick up the other person when they fall in a hole. No, that's got nothing to do with it, does it? It's very practical. If you're hiking with someone in the wilderness and someone breaks an ankle, (laughs) there's someone there to pick them up if they're walking with somebody else. If there's someone drowning, as we're often told, never swim alone, there's someone there to raise the alarm or someone there to help them out. Uh, I um, follow some surfing uh, threads and some surfing uh, posts and I find that oftentimes people's lives are saved if they're surfing with somebody else and they're attacked by a shark. Someone can apply a tourniquet of a leg rope or they can get them into the beach as soon as possible if that person's in shock. But it's very, very important when you're alone, it's very dangerous if you have an accident. And so Solomon points out two are better than one. Verse 11, again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? This reference is probably to those who are traveling through the wilderness or traveling through the countryside and they have to sleep out on the road in between. And if they're sleeping by themselves, they're going to get 
cold. Many defence forces, especially special forces of the defence forces of various countries, practice huddling together in cold environments to learn to um, moderate their heat loss. And so this is a truism. <laughs> and then verse 12, And if one prevail against him, one is beating him in a fight, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Two increases our defense capabilities. We can defend, each other, defend ourselves better if there's somebody beside us to help. And then we could even say at the end of that verse, perhaps Solomon is saying there, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. If two are good, three is better. But this could also be a cultural reference. Someone did a little bit of research on this and found that just around the time of Solomon, there was a very well-known poem or very well-known epic that was written in a nearby country. Part of that poem had a reference to this sort of idea. Schaefer's work, and I quote Longman again, Schaefer's work shows that Solomon is likely alluding to a well-known ancient Near Eastern proverb concerning the benefits of friendship. In that proverb, there's a man who's rowing his boat and there's a boat being towed behind by a three-part rope or a three-fold rope. And as he's paddling in that boat, the friend's boat is being pulled along behind and he's about to give up. And they said, don't give up because if you give up, your friend will suffer as well. And so perhaps Solomon is alluding to something that many people in the area are familiar with at the time, that two people working together can get each other through. Now, we can see an obvious application of a three-fold cord not easily being broken if we apply the idea that a friend is good, but two friends and the Lord are the best. And it's a good reminder for us to think that we need to apply the Lord to each of the relationships of our life. Do you know, it's not just the Bible and it's not just uh, anecdotal evidence that suggests to us that two are better than one or that there are dangers in solitude. Modern science is also supporting this idea, you know, people who work in very, very difficult situations. There's been um, people who are trekking by themselves through the Amazon jungle. And when they got back, they reported that the most difficult part of that trek was being alone. Not facing the elements, not any of the health risks, but being alone. People working in Antarctica was the same thing. There is evidence that isolation particularly leads us to be less able to manage stress, more prone to depression, uh, worse at processing information. That's a good thing to remember, isn't it? Worse at decision making, worse at memory skills. Of course, we would have a lowered immunity, which the information bears out as well. And some people even go to the lengths when they're by themselves for a while, a lot of reports of hallucinations. People are believing things to be true that are just false. And so the science bears out the evidence which supports what the Bible's been saying for a long time. That two are better than one. God created us to communicate he created us to cooperate. He created us to love, to share, to encourage, even to mimic, to follow examples. All of these things require that we rely on other people and that we have relationships. And there are many, many examples throughout the scriptures that prove that point further, that two are better than one. We can think of Adam and Eve. We can think of David and Jonathan. We can think of Elijah and Elisha. We can think of when the Lord sent out the disciples, he sent them two by two. And we can think of the fact that when God made Christians with all of the blessings of being in Christ, he didn't want them to be alone, but in a church. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. We are benefited by the presence of others. Now, marriage is only one application of this principle, and we are cutting this principle down, cutting it short, if that's what we see here. The greater principle here is that of companionship. And that's what we need to be practicing. The Lord tells us that two are better than one. And so what do we do about that? Well, that brings us to our third and our final point, solitude's solution. 
If this is what the Bible says, if the Bible recommends to us that it's good for us to be in community or in communion with other people, then how can we show support? How can we show that we believe this principle to be true? We can do it by seeing that we thrive in, excuse me, cooperation with other people. And there are two ways that we can display this in our actions. Number one, if we believe what the Bible says here, then we won't go it alone in life. We need to value the interactions that we have with other people. This loner that Solomon points out, he was by choice vainly working for himself and he didn't even see the vanity of it. He should have reminded himself of this principle that two are better than one. And that's something that we have to constantly say. I've found myself, even towards the end of this week as I studied this out, saying that to myself, two are better than one. And it comes up in a lot of situations. If we're working at the expense of family, if we're working at the expense of church time, we need to remember the importance of companionship. We need to remember that God made us to be interactive. Our work, our selfish interests won't satisfy us. And we know that because they're not satisfying us now. <laughs> More of it won't do any better. We need to also make the effort to visit people. Interact with other human beings. <laughs> it's not advanced, is it? <laughs> make the effort to visit Two are better than one. When there's conflict with other people, what are we inclined to do? Hermit mode. <laughs> Find something that doesn't involve conflict with other people. Go and lock ourselves away. No, the Bible tells us that two are better than one. We need to make this work. And we need to work it out the right way so that we can continue to enjoy the benefits of the way that God has made us. When we're frustrated that other people don't think the way that we think and it's hard to work with other people. When other people don't do things the way that we want to do things and it's difficult and we're rubbing up against people the wrong way, we need to remember two are better than one. We need to make it work. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24 is a very well-known verse. It says, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. If we know that this is true, two are better than one. Then if we want to be a two, or if we want to be a three, then we need to act like it. If, if we want friends, we need to act like we want friends, which the Bible says is being friendly. If you be friendly, you will attract friends. You know what is frustrating to hear? is when people say, I don't find church or I don't find this group of people to be a loving place because I sat in that place for four weeks and no one came up to me and spoke to me. I sat by myself and no one came and spoke to me for four weeks or for three weeks or whatever it might be. Now, sure, there might be a problem with that, but hang on, you sat by yourself for four weeks and didn't go and talk to anybody else and they've got a problem with love that's not right if we want friends we have to show ourselves friendly there's a very easy way to enjoy friendship interaction that's by being friendly instigating it but how else can we show that we believe two are better than one the other side of the coin don't let others go it alone don't go it alone ourselves, but then don't let others go it alone. We need to see the need that other people have for companionship. They need friends. They need workmates. They need Christians to encourage them. They need that. Now, the Bible tells us that you can't go around marrying people to make them feel like they've got company. So the way that you satisfy this passage is not to go and make a family. <laughs> the way that you satisfy this passage is to be a friend. 
That way you can do it over and over and over and over again and be an encouragement to the whole church, to everybody that you know. People will thrive with company, the right sort of company. And we can help others to thrive, therefore, by including them. How do we do that? Think of someone who's isolated by any reason and invite them over. Go and do something that's easy for both of you to do at the same time and be a blessing to them. Notice a task that they have to do and say, hey, can I help you with that? They might be a little bit um, unsure about whether to let you help them because might, you might not be up to their standard of the work that they want to do. But encourage them by showing that two working at it can be better than one. Think about the times when it would be difficult to be a one and go and make them a two or a three or a five. You see, two are better than one is not a principle that is meant to make people feel lonely. <laughs> two are better than one should motivate all of us to remember the value of companionship, all of us. And we need to seek that value out for ourselves and we need to make sure that we share it with other people in every way that the Lord allows us to. It is so important that we share ourselves with others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that your word is very simple and it helps us to see things that are very obvious, Lord, but oftentimes we forget. I pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes and help us to see how we can apply this principle, Lord. Help us to, to live this. We ask that you would show us, Lord, how we might be an encouragement to other people. Father God, we thank you for this time. I pray that you would, Lord, bless us with an understanding of your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.